Hey everybody, what's going on today? It's Music with Todd Ledbetter and we are in for a treat today. I'm bringing you one of the uh, most awesome albums from the 1970s. We're going to be covering the history of one of the most iconic albums from Aerosmith. The album is Toys in the Attic and that one's the one that put Aerosmith on the charts and started their journey to rock and roll immortality. So stay tuned and check it out. Now, if you've seen any of my videos, you know that, you know, I, I just speak my mind and I give you my opinion on what I like. And um, I like Aerosmith, but no matter what your taste is in music, you got to realize that whether you dislike Aerosmith or not, okay, there's no denying that this album hit really hard in the music industry in 1975. So strap in and let's take a look at the history behind the iconic release of Al, uh, Aerosmith's Toys in the Attic. Prior to the release of Toys in the Attic, the band was touring pretty hard and they were promoting their previous album, Get Your Wings, the band's second album. It was their second studio album, actually. And, you know, it did get a little bit of airtime, but it really didn't uh, take off and see much in the way of success. Um, but, however, the, the members of the band, they took full advantage of their time on the road. I mean, they were they were rocking hard. And in the biography of uh, Steve Perry, he spoke about some of the time on the road um, while they were playing in various clubs and doing multiple nights at, and weeks. Uh, the band really took some time to approve, improve uh, their musicianship and their skills and their connection with each other as well. Uh, kind of more on a musical level. Uh, so when the time came to get back in the studio for their third album, Toys in the Attic, they all mashed together really well. They, they mesh, meshed together really well, not mashed. They, they kind of mashed, but they meshed together really well. Uh, but, but on a completely different level, frankly, when they were in the studio for Get Your Wings, Aerosmith worked with uh, Jack Douglas. He was kind of a fame producer. Uh, and he worked on other famous musicians like uh, John Lennon and also Cheap Trick, just to name a couple. And when the band entered into the studio for the third album, uh, Jack Douglas, he knew that there was something different about the band. Uh, he was, it was even kind of more evident when Steve Perry started playing the guitar lick that he had come up with during some sound checks uh, in a show in Hawaii. Perry and Tyler, they already, already uh, having been in love with that riff, uh, they made sure that that one riff was the main focus of the album. And if you're familiar with this album, Toys in the Attic, you probably know what song I'm talking about and what riff it is. It's Walk This Way. So before we go on, we need to just take a little bit of time and pay some respect to the awesome origins of the song's title of Toys in the Attic. Believe it or not, uh, <laughs> they had been working on this song and they took a break to go see a movie in Times Square. <laughs> that movie that they watched was Young Frankenstein. If you haven't seen that movie, go check it out. It's a classic. Uh, during the part where Marty Feldman as Igor, if you remember him, the hunchback, uh, and uh, he, he's getting ready, he's got the limp, uh, the limp and you know the, the hunchback and he's getting ready to like limp down the stairs and he turns to Gene Wilder's character and he says, walk this way. <laughs> so it was not only one of the funniest and most iconic moments in that movie, uh, it was really the inspiration uh, for the title of the Aerosmith's new song. And there you go. You know, that's how awesome that is. That's pretty cool. Their time in the studio was well spent though, because never before had they had the band undertaken such a technical project from the constant refining while touring they rode the wave of confidence and pumped even more amazing songs out such a sweet emotion you see me crying and these breakthroughs were made even greater by the act uh the uh addition 
of Jack Douglas, who became really like the sixth member of the band. It was evident from that point on that Aerosmith was not only going to be a big name, but they'd also be able to play and perform on the same level as other greats of the time. Now, that's not without personal problems. Uh, if you are familiar at all with some of the 70s Aerosmith, you know what I'm talking about. In 1975, it may have been a defining time for Aerosmith. It was really the foundation for what would become one of the most famous musical careers. But for anyone that knows anything about the band, you will know that this was also a very difficult time for each of the members really personally. Uh, the decade was marred by massive amounts of drug use and horrible personal decisions from some of the band members. These days, of course, Aerosmith are very open about their excessive drug use during the 70s. In an interview, Steven Tyler, who's known, or who he is, uh, you know, I now clean. I think he's had some relapse, but he's now clean from the drugs. And he's admitted in interviews that through his worst time in the 70s, he spent nearly $6 million on cocaine alone. And Joe Perry also came clean about his addiction problems, admitting that he was strung out on heroin during his own wedding in 1975. And although this was the most defining time in their musical career, it was also one of the lowest points as men. I think it's probably necessary to stop and identify the silver lining though of all this i mean look drugs are horrible and the level that these guys went in in order to get high was terrible uh, the argument will always exist what if they were sober at the time i mean would they have been able to write music on the same level i mean i tend to side on the and, and kind of think that you know the drugs held them back from their real potential you know, what if Steven Tyler and Joe Perry were able to think clearly, how much more could they have accomplished? So in a crazy way, this kind of shows how talented the guys were, even though they were all drugged out at the time that they made an iconic album. Now, there are a few other things going wrong other than drugs as well. One more notable infamous time involved Steven Tyler and a young, uh, uh, a young woman uh, named Julia Holcomb. It's hard to call the situation anything but super creepy. I mean, you see, Julia was a 16-year-old girl that Tyler had become infatuated with. And even though he was in his late 20s, he was so bad, or he had it so bad for her that uh, he even talked Holcomb's parents into signing over guardianship to him. It's kind of unbelievable to think, think that. But according to Holcomb herself, he was able to do this by telling her parents that he needed papers so she could enroll in school while she toured with the band. So this went way past the level of creepy into the level of tragic for Julia, really. She had already had a very tough life before becoming involved with Tyler. And she had been in a terrible car accident where she suffered many injuries and lost several members of her family. And then her family, with whom she'd already had turbulent relationship, just gave up on the guardianship very flippantly. They just, that was it. They didn't have a problem with Stephen taking over, I guess. So Holcomb, Holcomb, it's H-O-L-C-O-M-B, Holcomb, uh, a minor teenager, was e, uh, essentially the ward of a drug-addicted adult, Steven Tyler. And as a, uh, an adult who legitimately thought he was in a perfectly normal and healthy relationship, soon enough, Holcomb found herself pregnant with Tyler's child. Okay, this is when he turned into a major jerk. When, he when she became pregnant, I even feel kind of creepy even telling the story, you know, Tyler pretty much just left her alone in the apartment with no money and no way to get around and very little food. And eventually she was five months pregnant and he convinced her to get an abortion. Holcomb reported that the procedure was very painful and traumatic. And even though Tyler was there by her side, 
uh, he would turn and snort cocaine every time the nurse left the room. So it's not a far stretch to imagine why things didn't work out. You know, they separated less than a year later. All right, so let's talk about how they shot to stardom. These were definitely some of the hardest times for the band, but through the years of the drug addiction, bad personal mistakes and broken relationships, they were still able to put out some amazing records. Well, at least this amazing record. Uh, when the album was released, it peaked at number 11 on the US Billboard chart, uh, 200 charts. Uh, it, it was at 63 and it was higher than their previous album, Get Your Wings. And the first single of the album was Sweet Emotion. Great song. It gained uh, some minor acclaim, reaching number 36 on the charts. However, it was their second single, Walk This Way, which shot Aerosmith to stardom. It peaked at number 10 on the Hot 100 in 1977. It was such an iconic song that it even brought back into the, it was even, uh, if you remember, brought back into the spotlight in 1986 when the hip hop group Run DMC covered it. And we see, we all remember the video and Aerosmith was in the video and the cover would help revive Aerosmith's career in the mid eighties, as well as bring hip hop music to the mainstream. Now that we're able to see Aerosmith's journey as a whole, we can sort of trace the iconic sound back to this one album uh, up to this point, their journey in their journey, uh, they were becoming a better band. They were learning how to mesh, but with their new, ever increasing talent mixed with an incredible production team. They evolved from a house band to a studio band and it was a defining album that would pave the way for a bittersweet career. Hey, thanks guys for watching today. Um, but get ready because I'm gonna go over the, uh, in the next video, I'm gonna go over uh, their next album, which is Rocks. It's another amazing album that was a great follow-up to Toys in the Attic. So be sure to hit the subscribe button and hit the notification bell. And that way you can have, uh, you can be notified when that comes up. Uh, not only do I, you know, love having you here, you're, de you're definitely not gonna wanna miss what's coming up. So uh, we'll see you guys next time. And uh, you guys uh, have a good day. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.